Some call me Steve, Dad, Husband or Friend. Others might call me Boss, Coach or Mentor. Today you can call me the Leadership Hacker. Thanks for listening in, I really appreciate it. My job as the Leadership Hacker is to hack into the minds, experiences, habits and learning of great leaders, C-suite executives, authors and development experts so that I can assist you developing your understanding and awareness of leadership. I'm Steve Rush and I'm your host today. I'm the author of Leadership Cake. I'm a transformation consultant and leadership coach and can't wait to start sharing all things leadership with you. On today's show we have Kristen Shivago. She's the president of Shivago Partners. She's a revenue coach and a digital marketing expert. Before we get a chance to speak with Kristen, it's a leadership happy news. South Korean baseball fans may not be allowed to watch their favourite teams live at stadiums due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but NC Dino stands were not empty thanks to life-size cardboard cutouts of portraits sent in by their fans. The Korean Baseball Organization League season kicked off this month after a five-week delay due to the coronavirus. All games were played, however, without any fans in attendance. No fans were allowed in, even though the league reopened. Dino's marketing manager Park Young Un said, We thought about a way of giving enjoyment to fans and motivations to players, but keeping everybody safe. The club had more than 60 fans participating by sending their own pictures in, along with their favourite players, and even their pets. Hung Dong Su, a 38 year old baseball fan, said outside the stadium, I can't go in, but my avatar is cheering the team on instead of me, and it just feels like I'm in the stadium. The club also set out cardboard cutouts of characters of other fans of other teams and declared its support for them on Twitter. The South Korean team are getting support from baseball teams across the United States and across the world and more and more fans are set to send their cardboard cutouts in to support the teams virtually. It was a major marketing hit. It's allowing a connectivity to the club, while at the same time promoting a togetherness, which of course creates fan loyalty and is demonstrating some great marketing leadership. That's been the Leadership Hacking News. If you have any news, insights or crazy stories that we could share with our listeners, please get in touch with us. I'm joined on today's show by Kristin Zhivago. She's the president of Zhivago Partners. She's a revenue coach, digital marketing expert, and author. Kristin, welcome to the Leadership Hacker podcast. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Keen to get inside the mind of what a revenue coach is. But before we get into that, just tell us a little bit about your backstory. So you've been a leader of Zhivago Partners for a number of years, and you've worked through Silicon Valley for a while. Just tell us a little bit about what you've done and... Tell us maybe a little bit about how you've arrived where you've arrived. So I started selling when I was really young and discovered really early on through some painful experiences that you need to know what you're talking about um, before you can sell it. And that painful experience was in a technical environment. And I just was so embarrassed that I didn't know what I was talking about that I decided to devote the rest of my career to selling and learning everything I could about tech. And I've been doing that ever since. It it never stops. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Yeah, I was the first woman to sell machine shop tools in in, uh, the U.S. As far as I know, the Pratt & Whitney distributor told me that was the deal. He gave me a catalog and, and, you know, I was back in the days of miniskirts and I just went out and sold, uh, called on companies. Back then I was in San Diego. There was a small Silicon Valley growing in in San Diego. Uh, And... I I really, there was one machine shop foreman who kind of called me out. You know, everybody came out to see who was there and why she was in the machine shop. This was back a while ago. And um, he asked me, you know, why is your drill bit better than the one I'm using now? And I didn't have an answer. And he said, honey, you better learn this stuff before you go out and sell. So that was my big fat embarrassing moment, you know, as a senior in high school. And I thought, you know, when you're senior in high school, you think you're hot stuff. And man, I I just slunk back to the car. And that's when I made that life-changing decision and um, been following that ever since. Been been a really great thing. Anyway, so started an agency in Silicon Valley, did that with my husband for a long time, and then 
the Macintosh came along and I said, why don't you retire? I'm going to go out and help people market in-house because they were all using the Mac to do stuff in-house. And I ended up inventing myself as a revenue coach. And I basically taught CEOs and entrepreneurs how to sell more by understanding what their customers really wanted to buy and how they wanted to buy it. Did a lot of marketing and sales turnarounds for companies of all sizes, including Dow Jones, and did a lot of work for IBM for a number of years, writing instructions for their marketing people. So it was fun. But as I got older, I started realizing that the digital marketing stuff was really confusing business owners, especially those that weren't digitally astute themselves, decided to help them and opened up uh, Zhivago Partners, which is a digital agency um, in 2017. And that's where I am now. I have a wonderful worldwide virtual staff and um, specialists and core infrastructure people. And we're just having a wonderful time. That's awesome. And uh, it's really interesting to notice that in many successful entrepreneurs like yourself, there seems to be that epiphany moment, that moment where something's happened in their in their life where they go, Rock, this is it. I'm going to head in this direction. <laughs> uh, great that it was so early for you in your career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You talk about a revenue coach. Mm -hmm. What's the role of a revenue coach? Well, as I said, I did a lot of marketing and sales turnarounds. So I'd go into a failing marketing department or failing sales department and I always thought I could do it in two or three months, and it always took eight. I mean, it was just the reality, and after a while, I knew that, of course. Um, but it takes time to get the current team where they're at, um, fire the jerk. If there's a jerk, you got to get rid of him because he's dragging everybody else down, he or she, and put the right people in the right jobs and get the processes fixed. Um, nine times out of ten, the biggest problems were always processes. And I found that in all of my revenue coaching work. So I literally have interviewed thousands of customers and worked with hundreds of CEOs and entrepreneurs. And that is the biggest problem. They they think they, they know um, what the customer's thinking and they don't. So there's just a lot of stuff that you have to work on to turn things around and, and make it a profitable exercise and make sure that you're marketing to the customer and doing the right thing. Often businesses, I think, tend to market with their own lens, don't they? Their own perception of, of what their customers want. And how does that kind of play out in the work that you do, changing that perception? Well, yeah, that ended up being the main job of my career um, in the sense that every time I went to work for a company, I'd ask them what was important to their customers. And they had a list of, you know, five or 10 things that they, they really believed were important to their customers. And then I'd go out and interview their customers and their customers had a completely different list. <laughs> so I knew that they were off the mark. They just weren't hitting the customer where the customer lived. Right. And going back to processes, I realized that I had this, I sort of have this famous quote now attributed to me, which is that branding is the promise that you make but your brand is the promise that you keep. And they aren't the same quite often. The tools that people have to keep their promises so that their brand actually matches their branding are the people, the processes, the policies, and the passion of the leader. And um, there's one other, I can't remember at the moment, but it's a lot of Ps. Anyway, the biggest one that was always a problem was the processes. They usually had pretty good people. If the guy wasn't a jerk, they had good policies, made good decisions, but the but the processes were terrible and people suffered under that. And even in the age of apps that we're living in now, where you're only as good as your apps, processes are a big deal, which is why when I started this company, I, I the first person I hired was an app whisperer, an infrastructure assistant kind of person who helped me build the systems, which is basically what Amazon did. You know, Jeff Bezos, he started with a, with, it was a process structured company. It was a process centric company. And he just plugged in all these other products into the processes that he built. It's really neat. And I particularly like that quote, by the way, branding versus brand. Branding is what you send out, isn't it? But mm -hmm. brand is where, the, where you make that emotional connection with your customers. Well, it's it's keeping your promises. It's whether you do what you say. If you say, 
we care about you and you leave them on hold for 15 minutes when they first call or they go through voicemail hell, well, guess what? Your actions say just the opposite, which is why people get angry at big corporations because they make all these glowing promises in their ads and everything. And, you know, we care about you and all that. And then you try to interact with the company and it isn't like that at all. They're like your worst enemy kind of thing. They're, they're stopping you from trying to achieve your goals. They don't understand you. They don't understand your mindset. And mindset plays a big part in it. And I guess we'll come to unpick some of that in a moment. I'm keen to explore with you because we had a great conversation the last mm -hmm. time we spoke where we share some similar views around the whole buying and selling principle. In my coaching and consulting career, not once have I found anybody who likes to be sold to, but they still have sales-driven <laughs> teams. What's your experience about the kind of the dichotomy of buying versus selling? Well, you, you bring up a really good point. Every CEO I've ever talked to doesn't like to be sold to, and yet they hire salespeople and they go out and they hunt and they make 100 cold calls and get through to one person. I mean, that, that system is very broken. It's, it's almost as broken as you can get in, in a business system. It just doesn't work. Right. And uh, customers have gotten so good with caller ID and everything, they don't even pick up their phone. They just wait to see who it was. And if they, they think they really wanted to talk to them, they're going to leave a voicemail. I've probably bought something off a cold call maybe once out of every three years or something like that. Maybe it's once out of every year. I don't know, but it feels like more. And every CEO is the same way, but they don't treat their customers that way. They assume that these, you know, marketing has a lot of language about targets and a uh, shotgun approach and, you know, rifle. And we treat these, these folks like they're, they're animals that we're hunting down. And it doesn't, it doesn't really work. It's kind of insulting. Um, and just calling someone out of the blue and thinking or assuming that they are going to be in the market for your product at that moment, we're kind of forgetting that there's a moment in time when somebody wants to buy what you're selling. And that moment is very urgent. And that moment drives all of the marketing things that people do, you know, search engine optimization, and they go out and they search, they talk to their friends, they read reviews, all of the things that you need to do to be there when they're ready are so much more important than just sending a guy out. You know, and I have nothing against sales. I've been in sales off and on all my life. My In my own company, I've always had like an 80 or 90% closing rate. I know how to sell. But selling isn't really selling anymore. Selling is being there when the customer has a need for what you sell and showing up when they go looking and then answering their questions. The buyer's journey is nothing more than a series of questions that need to be answered to this buyer's satisfaction. And the minute you answer in a way that turns them off or something, they're not going to tell you. We all play poker when we're being sold to. We're negotiating. We don't say, oh, man, you just blew it. I'm probably one of the few people in the world that actually does stop the sales guy and say, you just blew it because I can't help myself. You know, I feel sorry for him. But I'll say, some, you know, I, what you just said, is an absolute turnoff, and I will not buy from you. We're done. And he's just like, well, well, but Good feedback. Yeah. And I guess the salesperson's just going to get lucky if the customer is in that mm -hmm. buying space, unless you really understand that customer need and you understand the, the journey that they're about to take in that buying process, right? Yes. But again, there's a timing problem. <laughs> I mean, it's like going after somebody who, who's married. And just, you know, trying to get them to love you. And it's like, no, excuse me, I'm married. It's kind of like that. I mean, if you're just, if you're happy where you are, nothing they say is going to make you change your mind. If you're unhappy and you're looking for a solution, well, then you're going to be going out and looking for a solution. And your mindset will be, I have to solve this problem. And, and you leave breadcrumbs all over the place looking for a solution. And the trick is people have to be there when they go looking in that specific mindset. And that's how we get leads for our clients. We, we figure out what that specific mindset is, and it's very specific. And then we advertise to that, so to speak. We put the message out. We, we say those words that, that appeal to them in that mindset. 
So we're basically hunting for mindsets and they come looking for us. It's a matchmaking thing. Got it. And your whole approach now is driven through that whole mindset driven marketing approach, isn't it? Tell us a little bit more about how that came about. Yeah, I'm just, um, I'm actually um, going full scale on that. I'm just about to launch it. But so you're getting a preview. But it is the idea that if you understand very specifically what their mindset is, and the way you do that is, uh, as I point out in my book, Roadmap to Revenue, how to sell the way your customers want to buy. Um, in chapter three, I explain exactly how to go out and find the information among your current customers so you can basically reverse engineer a successful sale and create new sales in quantity because you will understand their exact mindset. And once you have that, then you want to make an offer that appeals to that specific mindset. And that leads to an outcome that both of you are happy with. Customer gets what they want and you get what you want. You get a sale. It's a formula. It's very simple. And the reason it's so hard is because people, um, I know that you know in my book, I talk about discovery, debate, and deploy. So you discover, you debate, and you deploy, which is how marketing should work. But people always miss the first part. They don't discover. They assume. And that assumption is very dangerous and very expensive. I bet. I've experienced that as a buyer, too having then ended up with perhaps the wrong solution as a result. Oh, yeah, that's really sad. I mean, regrets are in, in especially when you're buying a B2B, but even in B2C, I mean, regret, buying, buying regrets are very sad because you've spent the money, you've gone to all that trouble to get the right thing up. And in the case of, say, enterprise software, you've trained all your people, and then you discover we've all had this experience now because we've all had software long enough where you get the whole thing set up and then you discover there's a gotcha that's a deal killer. It's a showstopper. It's like, wait, I, I remember I had one of my clients before I showed up who had a group working for him and they were in, they had this great software program and he started to put his whole business on it. He spent $100,000 and then they discovered that it didn't interact with their mail program. Now you roll your eyes and say, well, excuse me, but it was some interaction thing where when the lead came in, you know, you'd, they'd be alerted. And this was a little while ago. Now everybody assumes that's going to happen, but he had to stop the whole thing. He wasted a hundred thousand dollars and all that effort and all that excitement and training and everything for something that didn't work. So buyers are skeptical. I mean, I used to say we're selling software in a skepticism swamp because people have been burned so often. I mean, software has been around a long time now and people have been disappointed. And I don't know how many project management systems I've gone through myself, um, probably 35 or 40 of them, really truly testing and trying to figure it out, making it work until you find the right one. And when it's good, it's really good. But getting there is hard and everybody promises that, oh yeah, no problem. It's all good. You know, it all work. If, you know, we can make it work. And then it doesn't work and you're out all that time and money. It's very frustrating. Given that we have so much more data at our hands now and, and marketing can be more scientific, what do you think the reason is that organizations spend a disproportionate amount of time getting their marketing right versus getting their sales channels right? Well, selling is is um, very understandable. So somebody who was is a finance guy or an engineer or something, it seems very black and white. You know, you send a guy out there, you make 100 calls and uh, every day or every couple of days, and, you know, you'll see results. I mean, it just seems like arithmetic. If you, if you beat enough bushes, you're going to get, you're going to shake something out of the tree or whatever I'm using for my analogies. Uh, so it makes sense. And and it ignores the customer's mindset completely. I mean, it even ignores the fact that they hate cold calls and they don't like being approached by salespeople and they do everything they can to avoid them in their own life, but they think it's okay to do that to their customers or to their prospects. Very true. Very true. And it just doesn't, I mean, and another thing they do is they think that the salespeople are bringing back market data. And the way I get around that is I look at the CEO and I say, okay, 
your salespeople are going out, they're talking to customers and they're coming back with, with valid customer data, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, we hear from them and they call us after the call and blah, blah. Okay. So when was the last time you told a salesperson what you were really thinking while you were being sold to? crickets because they never say, I mean, they're like I said, they're playing poker, they're negotiating. They don't want to give the guy, they don't want to tell the guy what they're really thinking. Unlike me, where I actually stop the thing and tell the guy that he's got a real problem here because I feel sorry for him. CEOs won't do that. They're just going to let you be stupid. And you go through the whole thing and they shake your hand at the end of the call. And then the CEO goes right back to his computer and starts Googling the solution again because he knows he's not going to hire that guy or the company. So they will not tell you what they're really thinking while you are selling to them. However, the secret, the big, the big thing that I learned was that they're more than happy to talk after you've sold to them and they're happy. They've invested in you and they want you to succeed. So they don't mind People are basically, unless they're jerks, they're basically helpful. And they'll spend 30 minutes on the phone with you. You ask open-ended questions so you get what they're really thinking, not what you think they're thinking with a survey or something where you're making them do multiple choice or whatever. But you're really just doing that discovery and finding out what they really think about that subject and, and getting the truth out of them. And then turning that into a report that's anonymized and, and categorized by question and answer so that the executives in the company finally get to see what people are really thinking, why they bought from this company, not the other company, what the competitors did, what they think about, what their concerns were, what their biggest problem is. And that gives you a map. I can't, I mean, every single time we're talking hundreds of times that I came back in with this information and the CEO and the other executives were in the room. They were, they were having that V8 moment, you know, where you slap your forehead. I could have had a V8. Right. It was like, Oh geez, I had no idea that people were feeling this way about us or gee, did they know that we made that mistake? Hmm. That's bad. You know, so you find the good stuff and the bad. And you actually understand who you're selling to for the first time and you respect them and you know they're smart because that's the other thing. Sometimes people think their customers aren't that smart. Customers are pretty smart. People, people buy things from the time they're five years old and probably sooner now because of iPads and, you know, Amazon and stuff. So we are, we are experienced buyers and we know what we want. And we know when we get it and when we're getting it from somebody and when we're not. It's very black and white. So they finally see the picture and then they start making good decisions, decisions that make sense and decisions that lead to more revenue and grow the company. That's what a revenue coach really does. That makes loads of sense for me. Your book, Roadmap to Revenue, was named by Forbes as being one of the top marketing and sales books written and I'd love to get a little bit of insight as to the key principles that you mentioned earlier. So in your book, you've got those three stages of discover, debate, and deploy. And we covered off the discover bit a little earlier on. In the debate stage, that's really what you focus on around that buying process. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, during the debate stage, I then want to educate them to the type of buying journey that we're talking about. And one of the biggest things contributions I think I make in the book, besides teaching people how to discover, is that there are basically four types of products and services in the world based on the amount of scrutiny that the customer applies to the purchase. So there's light scrutiny, medium scrutiny, heavy scrutiny, and intense scrutiny. Light scrutiny is impulse, cheap, Purchases the candy bar at the checkout counter, the you know the the tabloid magazine, whatever. It's just few, just one or two questions. Can I afford this? Can my waistline afford this? Um, should I buy this or not? That's light scrutiny. Um, medium scrutiny are products and services are things like clothing, where it's still pretty much one person making the decision, and there's maybe ten or fifteen questions. Will this fit? Do I like the color? Um, you know, maybe you're, you're worried about your significant other liking it or not, or 
but there, but it's a pretty simple buying process. Heavy scrutiny is when you really are making a big purchase. In the B2C side, it's cars and houses and things like that. There's a contract. There's a salesperson of some sort. And I always think of these salespeople really should be sales guides or buying guides. They help you make the buying decision in an honest, straightforward, you know, what are your trade your way? So it's like the trade-offs, the things you need. What, do you, what is your main concern? Okay, well, this will work or maybe it won't. That's really what we need now rather than people who are out hunting. So um, that's heavy scrutiny. And then in B2C, uh, the B2B side, those are big enterprise software programs or programs you're going to run your business on, something you make a deep commitment to uh, that's a big deal and it costs a lot of money. And then intense scrutiny products and services are those where it's everything that the heavy um, scrutiny is, but it's a, but you get married. It's a long-term contract. It's like two or three years and maybe it's a big consulting thing. That's where they're making airplanes, you know, Boeing or something. So the reason that I came up with this is because of the gap that I kept finding between the the company mindset and the customer mindset. And I had to close that gap somehow. And And I kept seeing people who were selling light scrutiny products and services as if they were heavy scrutiny products and services. Like you don't need a newsletter to learn how to chew gum kind of thing. It just was silly. Right. Um, and the same thing with the high scrutiny products and services where they were treating it as a branding exercise where all we have to do is just get the word out to everybody and we're great and we can do this for you and make this big promise. But they weren't uh, able to answer the very specific questions that the buyers had. And again, the buyer journey, which I was one of the first people to talk about selling as a buying journey, um, is, again, a series of very specific questions that need to be answered to the buyer's satisfaction in order for the sale to be made. That's basically it. So they weren't they weren't answering those questions. They didn't equip their salespeople to answer those questions. And these are end of the funnel questions as we talk about the funnel where they're really close to buying and now they just want to have three questions answered. The big thing here is getting on the agenda of, the, of that customer and consulting almost with that customer in that buying process, right? Yeah, you're their advocate. You're on their side. You're trying to figure out if what you can give them will actually satisfy those requirements in an honest, no BS kind of way. That's really what buyers want. Right. And nobody gives it to them. And there's a lot of psychology involved here too, isn't there? So the whole principle around calling somebody a salesperson versus a buying person, like a buying advocate or a buying assistant. Or a buying guide. Or, yeah, whatever the yeah, word is. Yeah, still have the haven't word quite yet, caught yeah. on to that, have they? No, because again, it's so easy to just put a guy on the phone. <laughs> you know, it just makes so much sense. You go out and you hunt, and it's it's it. When you think about it, it's pretty crazy the state that we're in right now because the buyers have completely rejected that approach, and yet we have a whole industry. I mean, there are millions of sales consultants and. You know, people out there who are continuing to help people get on that phone and make those calls and, you know, go for it, dialing for dollars. We're still doing that. And the customer has left us in the dust. I mean, we're selling buggy whips at an, and in time when people are driving cars. It's that bad. Right. And I think also my experience of salespeople is the agenda shift from I need to make a sale versus I need to help you buy is also the biggest thing that as consumers, we are now really attuned to, aren't we? Yeah, you're so right. You know the salesman's agenda the minute he opens his mouth. I mean, it's just, okay, I understand you're trying to make a quota. You, you're, That's all you care about is closing the sale. Well, I don't want to be closed. I don't Nobody wants to be closed. It's like, okay, 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 make a decision. Quick, quick, quick. Okay, it's all going to be fine. No problem. Just sign here. Quick, quick, quick. And people know, like I said, this is skepticism swamp. They've grown up 
buying things and regretting those purchases and dealing with the, you know, one of the things that people totally ignore when you're selling B2B is the the reputation whiteboard. When I was um, doing marketing and sales turnarounds, I would be an entrepreneur working in a very big corporation. And the first thing I learned was when you start that job, you get your own little personal whiteboard. It's like hung around your neck. It's just a small letter sized thing. I mean, it's just my, you know, my imagination of what this thing is. Every time you make a mistake, there's a black mark on that whiteboard and it, there's no eraser. Nobody ever forgets that you were the one that put in that enterprise program and the whole thing failed or that you didn't make your quota or whatever it was, or you said the stupid thing to one of the top executives or on a bad day or, you know, whatever it is, every time you screw up, there's a black mark on your whiteboard. And so one of the mindsets of the corporate buyer is keeping those black marks off that whiteboard, avoiding corporate embarrassment. <laughs> it's like one of the main drivers, the bigger the company, the bigger the issue, because if you get too many black marks on your whiteboard, nobody will even pay any attention to you anymore in a meeting. They'll just roll their eyes. Oh yeah, there's Bob again, you know. Well, don't pay any attention to him because he did that terrible thing back in 1979 and we're never going to forget it. <laughs> and the only way to get out of that uh, in many cases is to just people that have that problem, they have to leave the company because nobody's going to respect them anymore. Nobody's going to take their advice. They're not part of the team. They've been rejected. So that's what's driving. That's the biggest driver is the embarrassment factor. And yet we don't address that at all when we're selling. We, we just, people will just, just, you know, act like, oh, well, you know, you just go out there and you're going to get all this and you'll be a hero. And the guy's like, yeah, right. I'm going to be a hero. If this thing fails, I'm going to be toast. My favorite salesperson's line is when they call you up and the first line is, don't worry, I'm not trying to sell you anything. <laughs> <laughs> so guess what? You've just started the relationship with a lie. Exactly right. I mean, it's terrible. It's terrible the way we treat people we're selling to them. It's really rotten. It's like bait and switch and you lie to them. And yeah, so when people say that to me, I say, oh, okay, well, gee, it's 730. I'm trying to eat dinner and I don't know you. I've never heard from you before. Tell me really why you're calling if you're not trying to sell me something. <laughs> Do we know each other? You know, have we met before? I mean, I'm, 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 people really shouldn't call me because I'm terrible about that stuff. I just, I, I'm so sick of it. We have a, we have a bit of fun <laughs> with it in our family too, which we shouldn't do, right? Because no. people are trying to make a living and I, we get it. But equally, if we've also been consumers of selling, we recognize those patterns in people's tonality. And particularly when somebody says, I'm going to sell you, I'm not trying to sell you something. And we know they are. Our heckles go up as consumers, don't they? Mm -hmm. So heading over to your deploy stage. Yeah. What, what transpires here? Well, this is just classic, you know, carrying out projects. I mean, truthfully, once you understand the mindset of the customer and you've made a proper offer to that mindset, then you have to say, okay, where are they looking for us? That's the biggest thing. Are they in social? Would they actually go to social to buy from us? Or are they just going to social to see what we're tweeting about? And they would only do that as part of their buying process. But they have to find us when they go looking. And, you know, Google still owns 95% of the search market. So guess what? That's one of the places you go. And search engine optimization, where you're using your content and you're getting out there, there's, there's some ways to get on first page of Google. I'm not going to say what they are right now because I don't want to give it away. Um, in totally honest, uh, good content driven kind of way. But there's also advertising, and advertising does work these days. Um, that's where we're getting most of our leads for our clients, the fast stuff. There's sort of two things that happen. There's the quick, get leads as fast as you can stuff. And then there's sort of the back end. You need to be there as they're looking around, especially if you're selling a, a heavy or intense scrutiny product or service. They are going to check you out before they talk to a salesperson. And another famous quote, which nobody attributes to me, but I really was the first person, as far as I can tell, to say, in this age of the web, by the time a person talks to a salesperson, they've already gotten 60 to 80% of their 
questions, 60 to 80% of their questions answered before they get a salesperson on the phone. So they just want answers to those remaining very specific questions. They've already checked your site. They've checked your um, reviews. They've gone and talked to other people. They've you know, gone through Google and looked around. And so they've done a lot of homework and got 80% of their questions answered. Now they come to the salesperson who, by the way, is not trained to answer those very specific remaining questions. And instead, he wants to start his PowerPoint at, we were founded in 2001. And everybody's in the room like, oh God, do we have to sit through this now and go through the whole thing? They have two or three questions. If your marketing is really working, which by the way, mine does, which better do, or I shouldn't be talking to you. By the time they get to me, they have two questions. And I sell a very intense product or service. I sell, you know, we're getting married. We're, we're, I'm going to make sure that your company, your company grows. That's my responsibility. That's big, intense kind of thing. So they've done all their homework. They've decided they want to do business with me already. And they just want to know, am I interested in taking them on? When can I start? How much is it? They have three questions. So one of the the whole philosophies behind this heavy, medium, light scrutiny thing is that if you can get through your marketing to the point with a heavy or intense scrutiny product or service to the point where by the time they come to you, they have two or three questions as if it's a light scrutiny thing. Man, you've done your job. That's the goal. It's really clever and really focused. I love it. So as a leader of marketing agencies too, you have led people and this part of the show, we really want to tap into your leadership thinking. If you had to distill your years of leadership into, let's say your top three leadership hacks, what would they be, Kristen? I think the first one is don't assume, never assume. Because when we assume, we, we think we know it all. We think we know the answer. So you really have to always be curious, keep asking, keep trying to figure out, keep being humble, not only with your with your customers, but your partners, your staff. Just assume that you don't know it all. And by the way, I didn't get to this point until, you know, after my 50s, because you have to get over yourself in order to um, get past that point of thinking you know it all or wanting to know it all or needing to know it all. You really have to get over that and just keep being humble that you might, in fact, learn something today from somebody else. Right. And that's the key, because if you do that, then you are going to understand the customer's mindset. You are going to understand your staff and what they want, what makes them happy, and try to give it to them. And the second one is make it a nice place for nice people to work. I have a no-jerk policy. Clients, vendors, our staff, absolutely, the minute anybody puts their hands on their hips, that's it. We're done because we don't do that around here, including me. I'm not allowed to put my hands on my hips either, by the way. And that makes it a, a, a culture where it's a nice place, a happy place. For It's a safe place for good people to work. And they love it. They love it. It's just so wonderful. You're not being stopped. And by the way, the definition of a jerk is somebody who makes it harder for other people to do their work. Nice people try to make it easier for you to do your job. They they try to help. They they try to, you know, give you what you need. And a jerk does just the opposite. Everything's a struggle. You never get a good decision. They love everybody paying attention to them because they don't know the answer. It's a power trip. So we we have a jerk-free environment and it's a wonderful place to work. I think I'm going to be sharing that with my clients and colleagues around, hey, do you have a, a no-jerk policy? Yeah, exactly. Because ultimately... We put up with a lot of BS from people, yeah, unnecessarily. But yeah. if it's you know right from the outset, people understand this is the way we do things. This is the environment we've got. It just creates the right tone from the start, doesn't it? Yeah, and it helps you help your customers too, because one of the reasons it's hard for employees to help customers is because their boss is a jerk, so they have to work around that somehow. And if your boss is a nice person who wants to help the customer, well, gee, guess what? You know, you're all on the same page. The customer's happy. You're happy. The boss is happy. So it's really a wonderful way to go. And the third thing I would say that I've learned is never give up. Never give up. I mean, no matter what's happening. I mean, I learned that in Silicon Valley. We had many recessions in Silicon Valley where people would think the valley was dead. 
So when my husband and I were running an ad agency, we made this poster called The Valley Lives and we sent it around. People put it up in their conference rooms. And it was just about the fact that there's always money flowing somewhere. I mean, there's trillions of dollars that change hands every single day in the banking system. It used to be three trillion. I think it's up to five or now or something, but it's a lot of money. Somebody's always buying something somewhere. And you just have to figure out who is it? What do they want? How can I help? How, what is their mindset? How can I address it, make an offer that will appeal to them in that mindset? There's always a way to make money if you are humble and you, and you go after just that one thought that you're trying to help somebody achieve something. How can I take what I do and apply it to that? And by the way, that's a big deal right now with COVID and all the stuff that's going on with this virus. Same thing. Sure. What do people need? Yep. How can we help? If not even more so now, just understanding their lens at a different level, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's Things are different. We are always going to, this thing has radically shifted us, all of us, the whole world has shifted. It's a big deal. And so people are going to approach things differently and prioritize things differently and need different things. And we have to understand quickly what those mindsets are. So we affectionately call this part of the show Hack to Attack. And it's where we learn from our guests, a period in their life or their career where things haven't gone well or they may have screwed up, but they've used that lesson as something that's now positive in their life. What would be your hack to attack? Well, I already talked about it. That that <laughs> that humiliating experience when I was a senior in high school and I went out to my car with my tail between my legs. That was that I was I remember distinctly standing in that parking lot. You know, I had a 52 Chevy or something. I was standing there. And I didn't even go into my car right away. I just stood there in the parking lot feeling the full scale humiliation and saying to myself, man, I just screwed up. I mean, you know, I had that, I had the whole thing ready. They would have bought from me. I, I saw the sale, you know, when you're a salesperson, it's like, I tell people I'm a recovering salesperson, but you saw, you saw it, you know, it, they, he could have bought. But he didn't. And it was because of me. It's such a vivid emotion for you still, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It, it was just, I, I knew right then, you know, and I was a singer. I was in show business. My whole family was in show business. I could hold an audience in the palm of my hand while I was singing, you know, it was a big ego boost. And that's the other thing. I mean, you, you really do have to get over yourself to succeed in business. And that that was that moment where I knew there was something more than just holding an audience, just being good at performing. It was something way bigger and way deeper. And I've just devoted my life to it. So that's that's really the the main thing, you know? And, and every time you, you go through a recession or something and you have to learn. But the other big thing for me was that that realization that the, the difference between the gap between the customer's mindset and the company mindset is always amazingly large and they don't even know it. They don't even know how far off they are. So those two things were things that have just driven me and driven me and driven me. Brilliant stuff. And the last thing we want to explore with you is to do a little bit of time travel now. And if you're able to bump into Kristen at 21, what would be the one bit of advice you would give her? Kind of the same thing, like get over yourself, you know, calm down, watch more than you talk, look around, sort of figure this out, you know. I mean, I'm not stupid. So I knew I had smarts and and it's when you're when you're smart enough to kind of get by in life, you have a tendency to think that, you know, you you're you're pretty good. I wasn't it wasn't that I was conceited. I was never conceited, but I had sort of a confidence in my own mental abilities. And the problem with that is then you kind of like being right. <laughs> and that's a big mistake. It's a big mistake. Yeah. Because honestly, I mean, I have people working for me now that every single day, somebody says something that makes me slap my head and go, yep, golly, that's a great idea. <laughs> that is such a great idea. We're going to do that, you know, and I've gotten more satisfaction in my older times now and my, you know, my, my advanced age, I've, I've much, I'm much happier with those moments than I am with me being the one that knew the answer. To me, that's just, okay, I'm under, you know, I've gotten a lot of experience. I know what to do in certain situations. I usually have an answer, but I'm very calm about it. It's not a big deal to me. What's really exciting is when 
one of our staff comes up with a great idea that I hadn't even thought about. That's fun. It's really turned into a, a big high for me. I'm so proud of them. I'm so excited. So great. that's the big thing. And it's also great leadership too. Yeah. So finally, we want to make sure that our listeners can get in touch with you and continue the dialogue where we leave off. Where would be the place that you would like them to go? The best thing is just go to zhivagopartners.com. I mean, everything's there in my blog articles, my podcasts, um, my book. And as we roll out this mindset-driven marketing, we're going to have um, a guide for that that's coming out over the next month or so. So everything that I do is pretty much in that. I also write a blog for the up-and-comers. Um, it's kind of a labor of love. It's called Christianswisdom.com. And that's just for people getting out into business uh, who really went through the school system and didn't learn anything about business. And of course, you're going to spend the rest of your life in business. So I'm just trying to help them understand what's really going on and what really works and hopefully avoid some of the mistakes that we all make when we're younger and full of ourselves. That's lovely. And we'll make sure that all of those links are in our show notes as well. So as folk are finished listening to this, they can literally just click into the show notes and, and go take a look. So Kristen, it's just for me to say, it's been really lovely talking to you. There's some super hints and tips and ideas to help people think about the way that they approach marketing. And, and certainly mindset driven marketing is for me, I think where the future lays for organizations and for businesses. So Kristen, thank you so much for being on the Leadership Hacker podcast. I loved it. You were great. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I genuinely want to say a heartfelt thanks for taking time out of your day to listen in to. We do this in the service of helping others and spreading the word of leadership. Without you listening in, there would be no show. So please subscribe now if you haven't done so already. Share this podcast with your communities and network and help us develop a community and a tribe of leadership hackers. And finally, if you'd like me to work with your senior team, your leadership community, keynote an event, or you would like to sponsor an episode, please connect with us via our social media. And you can do that by following and liking our pages on Twitter and Facebook. Our handle there is at Leadership Hacker. Instagram, you can find us there at the underscore leadership underscore hacker. And at YouTube, we're just Leadership Hacker. So that's me signing off. I'm Steve Rush and I've been the Leadership Hacker.